day, and welcome to Epstein Becker Green's webinar, What's New About Privacy and Consent for Substance Use Records, part of the Substance Use Disorders Crash Course webinar series. Before we begin today's presentation, please be informed that today's webinar is being recorded and the participant phone lines will be placed on mute throughout the program. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint material. We are pleased to have a fantastic speaker today. Gregory Mitchell is an associate in the Healthcare and Life Sciences Practice in the New York office of Epstein Becker Green. Mr. Mitchell negotiates agreements by and among managed care companies, insurers, hospitals, health systems, behavioral health and substance use disorder treatment providers, physicians, and ancillary providers. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Gregory Mitchell. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, like we mentioned, we're going to be discussing uh, the privacy regulations for substance use uh, disorder records, which are codified at 42 CFR Part 2. And these regulations have been around uh, since about the mid-70s, I believe, but in, on January 18th of this year, SAMHSA released uh, the final rule updating these regulations, and it was the first meaningful update to the regulations uh, in 30 years. So on January 18th, the final rule was published and was to be implemented, I believe, in the middle of February, uh, but the Trump administration's regulatory freeze uh, put a pause on that. Uh, but the rule was implemented on March 21st of this year, uh, so rest assured that all the changes we'll be discussing uh, in this presentation are currently in effect. Uh, now, I'm sure some of you out there have some previous experience uh, with the Part 2 requirements, uh, but if you don't, I'll draw the analogy a couple times that uh, the protections are similar to HIPAA, but it's important to remember as we're discussing them uh, that Part 2 is much stricter, and it presumes uh, that records should not be disclosed without patient consent, except for some very limited circumstances. And we'll get into those and how to properly do a patient consent uh, coming up. So the first question is, uh, to whom and what does uh, 42 CFR Part 2 apply? Uh, so moving on here. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Information that's protected uh, includes any information that would identify a patient, uh, either directly or indirectly, as currently having or in the past having had a substance use disorder. And when I say indirectly, uh, the regulation makes clear information that could, uh, by reference to other publicly available information uh, or through verification by another person, uh, demonstrate that a, the record relates to an individual substance use would be protected. Uh, but those records are only protected under Part 2 if uh, they were obtained or created by a federally assisted drug abuse program, uh, which is commonly referred to as a Part 2 program. Uh, so that, of course, begs the question of what constitutes a Part 2 program. And there are two basic criteria for a program to be a Part 2 program and subject to uh, these particular privacy regulations. Uh, the, one of them is that it meets one of the four criteria that you see listed in the bullet points, which we'll get into. Uh, but the first is important to keep in mind, and, and the first criteria is that the program holds itself out to provide substance use uh, treatment. If it doesn't hold itself out to provide that type of treatment, it's not going to be a Part 2 program. So if it holds itself out to the public as providing substance use disorder treatments, and it satisfies one of these four criteria, it's going to qualify as a Part 2 program. And those criteria include uh, that the program is conducted either directly or uh, through contract in whole or in part by a federal agency. And there are some carve-outs of VA and some armed service programs, uh, but generally if it's conducted by a federal agency, no matter how it's conducted by that agency, it's going to be a Part 2 program, again, if it holds itself out to be a substance use uh, disorder treatment program. Um, also, if the program is carried out pursuant to a license, certification, registration, or authorization granted by a federal agency, it's going to be a Part 2 program. And this can include Medicare providers, authorized maintenance treatment programs, or uh, just a registration, a DEA registration to dispense controlled substances. Um, so you might be thinking this is a particularly broad category, and you know, what happens if we're talking about a general hospital or a larger medical facility? 
uh, that provides uh, some substance use services and some other types of services, and the regulations directly address that. Um, if there is a specific unit or staff within a general medical facility that holds itself out as providing substance use uh, disorder treatment, uh, then that facility is considered to be part of a Part 2 program. Uh, but if it doesn't have a particular uh, staff or unit within the facility, it's not going to qualify. So merely because a, a general health care facility accepts Medicare patients or has uh, you know, a physician group has a DEA a registration uh, doesn't mean that it's going to be a Part 2 program unless it has some subset that holds itself out to provide substance use uh, disorder treatment. You can also qualify as a Part 2 program uh, either by receiving federal assistance directly or indirectly or by uh, through a state or local government that receives federal funds, uh, regardless if those funds are specifically used for the particular program uh, or not. Or finally, if the entity uh, is a tax an entity under the Internal Revenue Code, it will also qualify as a Part 2 program if it holds itself out uh, to be such a program. We'll also get into this a little bit later, uh, but any provider or entity that receives Part 2 protected information uh, has to uh, maintain those protections. If it properly receives the records, it, those records remain subject to Part 2, even if the uh, recipient is not a Part 2 program. And as we'll also discuss a little bit later, uh, it's important to remember that even if you're looking at this and you're thinking, you know, we don't fall into one of these categories, we don't receive federal funds, uh, you're not entirely in the clear. We'll talk about state laws that need to be considered as well. Um, but if you're a Part 2 program, uh, you'll have to have a patient consent form to disclose information uh, that you obtained or created. So moving on here, uh, the question, of course, is what, what needs to go to those patient consents and how do the recent changes that we've discussed uh, affect the patient consents? So if you're familiar with the patient consents already, uh, you may be aware that up until these changes took place, if a patient wanted to disclose uh, his or her substance use records to his or her treating providers, he or she would need to specifically name each individual provider. Uh, the regulations have been updated and should make this easier for everybody working with these consents uh, that the patient doesn't need to list by name his or her treating providers anymore. He or she can simply state that he or she wishes to disclose his or her substance use records to his or her treating providers without naming each one, and that will be sufficient uh, for disclosure. It is important to note, however, that it's not quite that easy. Um, if a patient uh, marks that designation on his or her consent form, the Part 2 program that receives the consent has to inform the patient that the patient has a right to receive a list of every provider that has received uh, his or her substance use records uh, pursuant to that. So if a patient selects that, you still need to record everybody who you make the disclosure to pursuant to that consent uh, and be able to provide that to the patient. Well, the, uh, to whom the disclosure is being made is a little broader. Uh, the changes also require that the kind of information that can be shared needs to be a little bit more specific. So patients can still consent to disclosure of all of their substance use disorder records. But if you're going to give the patient an option on the consent form, uh, the consent form must also have more granular options, such as medication, substance use history, employment information, living situation. And the regulations make it clear that these options must be spe specific enough uh, for the Part 2 program that receives the consent to identify the information necessary uh, to, for, to disclose for the stated purpose. Uh, so, of course, the consent form must also have the purpose for the disclosure. And that can be, you know, for coordinating care amongst my treating providers, you know, coordinating my, my treatment amongst my treating providers. Uh, I choose to disclose all my substance use disorder records. The, the consent form, in order to be proper under the regulations, also must contain the date of the consent, patient name, the name of the Part 2 program receiving the consent, uh, the date, event, or condition upon which the consent can be revoked, uh, and it's important that the consent cannot last longer than the time that is reasonably necessary to complete its purpose. Uh, 
Uh, so it can't necessarily last in perpetuity. It has to be tied to some uh, end date. And the consent must also contain the statement uh, that it can be revoked at any time by the patient. Uh, but you can put in the statement, and it remains the case, that a Part 2 program has acted in reliance of a consent uh, that was revoked. If it acted in reliance prior to the revocation, uh, it's not going to be liable for improper disclosure. The regulations also state that the disclosure can be signed electronically uh, for the technologically savvy programs out there or those looking to save some time on patient intake. And it's important to note for the program that the disclosure is invalid if it is expired, fails on its face to conform with the regulatory requirements, so if it's missing some of the information that we just discussed, uh, is known to have been revoked, uh, or is known or could reasonably be known to be false. So in those situations, you cannot rely on the consent, uh, and it's invalid. Uh, so those are the situation, you know, that's, that's how you get a patient consent, and as we talked about, that's the presumption is a requirement for patient consent, uh, but there are some situations uh, in which access can be granted without the patient consent. Uh, so moving on here, as I mentioned, first of all, it's important to note that if you obtain a disclosure pursuant to patient consent or pursuant to one of these other methods, uh, even if you're not a Part 2 program, you cannot redisclose that information. You, that information is going to remain subject to Part 2. And again, if you're familiar with uh, Part 2 already, you may know that every disclosure must be accompanied by a required statement that says exactly that, uh, that the information is protected and its redisclosure is prohibited. Uh, if you already have a form out there uh, that you've been using that has an information that you put with disclosures, just know uh, that that statement has been updated in the new regulations very mildly, uh, but the new language is at 42 CFR section 2.32 uh, if you're going to update that. So, if you don't have a consent and you have, you're either Part 2 program or you receive Part 2 information, uh, there are really four main situations in which you can uh, disclose that information without a patient consent. The first is a qualified service organization. So, returning to my HIPAA analogy, these are similar to, but not exactly like, uh, your business associate. So, here, disclosures are permitted to any entity that provides services. It could be data processing, billing, lab, uh, legal, accounting. Population health is an important new addition uh, based on the updated regulations where well, you can disclose uh, this information to a qualified service organization providing population health services. Uh, disclosures are permitted in these situations uh, by a Part 2 program to that organization if it's entered into a written agreement. But the disclosure only uh, can be broad enough to the extent that it's necessary to provide those services uh, pursuant to that written agreement. So it's not necessarily a grant to access all of the Part 2 information. Um, you know, it has to be a limited disclosure pursuant to the services provided in that written agreement. Audits and evaluations are another permitted disclosure, uh, but again, they're limited to Medicare, Medicaid, and SHIP auditor evaluations. And here, another important addition uh, is that if the audit is necessary for a CMS ACO to meet its requirements, uh, then it can obtain Part 2 protected information without that patient consent. So if you know, you're, you're doing an audit uh, for your shared savings payment or your quality improvement uh, and you're a CMS ACO, uh, then you can perform those audits without uh, necessarily having patient consent. There are other exceptions for research and medical emergencies. And, uh, you know, of course, we can get caught up in all these exceptions and consents, but it's always important to remember patients can always access their own records. Um, and if there's a court order for the records, uh, if a coroner needs the records to determine cause of death, uh, then they, the disclosure can be permitted outside of these four scenarios we just spoke about. So that's the applicability of Part 2. Uh, but as I mentioned, you always have to look out for state laws. Um, <clears throat> so moving on here, like HIPAA, uh, Part 2 states that it does not preempt state laws that are stricter uh, than Part 2. The good news is many states tie their state statutes directly to the federal requirements in Part 2. Uh, Illinois, New York, Virginia are some examples of, of many others that do that. Uh, and even more have statutes, state statutes that are less strict than Part 2, meaning that they are preempted by Part 2. 
uh, California, Pennsylvania, and Texas are some big examples, uh, but it's a pretty long list. Uh, but even if that's the case, you need to be conscious of your relevant state laws uh, that could affect disclosure. For example, Florida actually does have a stricter statute than Part 2, and essentially applies the Part 2 white protections uh, to a broader class of practitioners in hospitals than Part 2 does. Uh, but similarly, you know, even in New York, where it's tied directly to Part 2, um, you know, you need to be aware of where these records are coming from and other relevant protections, because the mental hygiene law actually has a, a provision that states uh, if records are developed in a facility operated by the Office of Mental Health or an office with people with developmental disabilities, uh, there are more stringent protections for those records, which may include substance use records, than just Part 2. Uh, so whenever you're doing, you have, to, you have to take a look beyond just Part 2 and make sure that there aren't other relevant state restrictions, even if the state is preempted or ties directly to Part 2. Um, so just a, a final thought on uh, these, these new regulations. You know, the recent changes to Part 2 were designed to help uh, balance privacy concerns with the increase in care coordination and population health management um, that was going on. So just moving on to the next slide here. Uh, the difficulty, uh, SAMHSA was trying to balance the difficulty in accessing this information. And with the opioid epidemic going on, you know, you can certainly think of issues of you know, uh, treating physicians, not being aware of patient substance use history, and inadvertently prescribing opiates uh, that could cause a relapse of somebody with substance use, obviously, is something you want to avoid. But, you know, at the same time, there's still a stigma attached with substance use uh, disorders. And I provided this one study here because it's the most recent, but there are others that you can find that make a similar point uh, where sub patients with substance use disorders. Uh, have a higher hospitalization rate uh, than the average population, though not necessarily solely because of their substance use disorder. Um, many of their hospitalizations are, are related to other issues. Uh, but in this particular analysis, researchers found that of 17 quality indicators comparing patients with substance use disorder to those without, um, these quality indicators that were to measure adherence to clinical guidance and treatment protocols, about half were significantly lower for patients with substance use disorders than without. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can appreciate that looking at these regulations, you know, we might want, you know, we might find issues. It, it may still cause some uh, concerns and, and wrangling to deal with uh, population health and, and care coordination that we'd like to be able to do. Uh, but it's important to remember why these are in place, and it's to, to help protect. Uh, patients with uh, these substance use disorders and make sure they receive the quality of care they deserve. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, you can reach out to me uh, via phone or email, the contact information there, and I'd be happy to discuss them with you. So thank you again for your time. Thank you, Greg. And thank you to everyone who has joined us. This does conclude today's webinar. As Greg mentioned, you're welcome to submit questions directly to him at Mitchell at evglaw.com or using the phone number displayed. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint materials. Uh, we hope you'll join us for the final installment in this substance use disorder series taking place next Tuesday, June 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern. For additional details or to watch recordings of previous webinars, visit www.evglaw.com backslash events. Thank you very much.